Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'm going to I'm going to call the court to order now. So welcome. We're all on the jury because the jury is out. The judge is making the decision about climate change and where we stand. And all of us are part of the jury. And so we're all part of the decision making process. I'm Elizabeth Valencia, representing FIABSI, the International Real Estate Federation. And I'm here to welcome you as we explore a story today about how to, how can we use our skills and our relationships to work on this climate issue for the world. So we're going to start out looking at an existing smart city in from Zurich, Switzerland. And this will be, become a model for other locations in the world. So this first one is existing. We wanted to find something to use as a pilot that was real. And so we'll look at this video of the smart city and um, hold your questions and thoughts. Thank you. We were founded in 1951 to create a global network for rebuilding after World War II. We have actually a Swiss chapter that has brought to my attention a special project of a green city. And we want to feature the benefits of living and working within that community. Our focus on the power of place is to showcase the change makers who are creating the healthy, and holistic communities of tomorrow. We're proud to feature a project identified by our Swiss chapter, Living the Sustainable Experience. Green City zeichnet aus, dass es zum einen eine gemeinsame Idee hat. Die gemeinsame Idee ist das Leben nach der 2000 Watt Gesellschaft. Es gibt sehr viele kleine Projekte und das ist ein Lebensgefühl, was hier die Leute zusammenbringt. Und das ist das Schöne und deswegen arbeite ich auch gerne hier. So the idea of the fair tiler is to reduce food waste in a very easy and pragmatic way. 30% of the food in households is thrown away, although it is good and edible. And the idea is if you have too much food, maybe you went to the supermarket bought too much and then you don't have the time to consume it or you go on holidays, you can just put it in the cupboard and other people can take it up. It's not a social idea, but an ecological idea that food that is still good and edible and looks nice can be just taken by others. Smarty 2000 Watt Quartier sind der Schweiz ihre Antwort auf den Klimawechsel. Wir versuchen von heute mit einem Absenkpfad, der vorgeht und definiert ist, auf 2000 Watt und 2000 Kilo Klimagas pro Person zu kommen im Jahr 2035 und von dort mit neuen Technologien, die wir heute noch nicht kennen, können bis Net Zero bis 2050 gehen. Die 2000 Watt Kriterien sind für FIABZI in der Schweiz wichtig. Sie sind weltweit wichtig, weil sie für alle Menschen auf der Welt wichtig sind, wenn wir wollen, unsere Klimaziele erreichen wollen. FIABZI hat als weltweite Organisation mit Niederlassungen und Chapters in über 70 Ländern die grosse Chance und den Hebeleffekt die bekannt zu machen und auch in unser Programm weltweit zu integrieren. Als wir damals am Reisen waren, haben wir gewusst, wir wollen irgendwann zurück in die Schweiz, aber nicht durch irgendein Wohnprojekt, sondern wir sind extra zurückgekommen wegen der Green City. Wir haben uns für das 2000 Watt Projekt entschieden, weil uns der ökologische Fußabdruck enorm wichtig ist im Leben. Und Wohnen macht einen ganz grossen Teil aus dem ökologischen Fußabdruck. Und genau das kann ich hier in der Green City ausleben. Wir haben eine wunderbare Gemeinschaft oben drauf noch zu diesen äh, 2000 Watt Zielen. Und äh, das ist wunderbar und ich hoffe, es gibt noch ganz viele so Projekte, schweizweit und weltweit, die genau das umsetzen. We are very proud with uh, what we did here together in Green City Zurich and of course we use that to expand so we built many of us uh, in Switzerland and we, we wish to, to build much more in Switzerland but also outside Switzerland. 
Nachhaltigkeit ist für uns als Unternehmen schon immer ein wichtiges Thema gewesen. Wir haben aus diesem Grund im letzten Jahr auch unseren Transport CO2-neutral gestaltet. Ab diesem Jahr werden wir auch unseren Standort CO2-neutral gestalten. Und das spielt natürlich so ein Standort wie Green City eine grosse Rolle. Ich kann von hier raus und finde ich diesen wunderbaren Platz da draußen. Mit wahnsinnig vielen Leuten meistens ist es auch sehr schön. Das hat sich auch sehr bewertet bei uns in der Zeit der Pandemie, also als wir uns zurückziehen sollten. Also es war sehr schön, einfach diese Begegnungen, die wir dort haben konnten, mit verschiedenen Leuten aus ganz verschiedenen Kulturen. Das macht das auch so lebenswert hier. Und daraus sind einfach wahnsinnig tolle Situationen auch entstanden und auch Projekte die wir hier gemeinsam mit dem Nachbarn aus ganz verschiedenen kulturellen und sozioökonomischen Gruppen, aus Hintergründen, können wir eigentlich alle zusammen miteinander eben so etwas Gemeinsames machen. Thank you to our sponsors and partners. We want to hear about your successes and challenges. We're all in this together. Thank you. And uh, Anna, you will be our first spokesperson yes. from Zurich. Anna Schindler is, is coming to us. Um, she was involved with the processing of the smart city. And Anna, if you will please um, tell us a little bit about your experience and how you see this moving forward in the next three years of where you see this project going and where it has been. Yes, thank you very much and hello to everybody. Um, the project we have seen in the film is really the first 2000 watt area in Switzerland. It has been certificated, it has got a certificate. Um, in the meanwhile, it has become a, like a new part of the city with 4000 people more living there and 4000 people more working there. And it has had and, and a lot of affordable housing, one third is affordable housing. And it has had um, a big impact because um, the idea, the concept of the 2000 watt has, has uh, you know, originally uh, came from ETH Zurich, but it has been adapted there for the first time. There has been um, a huge influence of politics also of the parliament. And um, now we have, or we already have four sites, four 2000 watt sites in the city of Zurich. Um, and they are really like role models. And the whole city, you know, is on the way. We have had a referendum in 2008, I think they said in the film, that the whole city will become a 2000 watt society. Um, we have gone even further on the way to net, net zero right now, net zero till uh, 2040. But this project has been, um, I think, the first that has given such um, an impulse to the other ones. And I think um, Switzerland has been asked to look at trademarking this process so that it can be expanded throughout the world? How do you see that happening? Yes, um, I think on one hand, it has been Switzerland has, has um, really put some, a lot of effort in this process. And um, we already have um, right now in 2021, 38 um, areas, 2000 watt areas like this one you have seen like Green City and um, it's a certificate and um, 24 of them are, are still in development, but it has been a big influence all over Switzerland. But it also has had an impact um, on the city's politics because it's not only about um, 2000 watts, it's about um, optimizing the existing buildings energetically everywhere. It's about using renewable energy in all that we construct. We have um, a new structure plan for the city that's right now um, on the vote, on the referendum, and there um, energy, energy, energy consumption and sustainable development um, have a very important part, play a very important role in this whole structure plan. And if we have plans for district heating for big parts of the city, um, energy networks, so there's um, a lot that has gone on um, since this first great example. What is your feedback from the citizens that live in the city? One of the things we talk about in marketing is being able to show people benefits. And what are what do the people feel? What makes other people envy the residents mm -hmm. of the 2000 watt city? 
Um, I, I think I think people in, here in Zurich are um, very very um, very very aware of of, the pro of all the problems because you have seen this in this referendum on the 2000 Watt Society I think 13 years ago with more than 75 percent of people who said yes we want that we want to go we want to start this pass. And then now they see um, people living in, in these 2000 watt areas. They have, um, they live very well. They have nice houses. They have a, 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 good, um, a good balance on energy consumption. And it's, I think it's a really, for people here in Zurich, it's really an aim to get there. We have also a big climate, climate movement. So it's, people are really interested in getting there and they don't object for instance, we have a big program started right now uh, for changing heatings. So oil and gas heatings are replaced by renewable energy. And um, all the owners of, we have 70% of private owners of our buildings, but they, are, they all are, um, are working together to, um, to support this initiative. Good. Thank you very much. I hope you can stay with us for a few minutes so yes. we can hear about the project uh, concept in India, and then we'll come back for questions. Thank yes. you. Thanks. Okay. Suhas, you're joining us from Puma, India. And uh, we thank you for taking time today and to be here with us at COP. This is a very important conference. Your president made some very important comments here. It seems India is on board with uh, the climate initiatives. And we'd like to hear a little bit about this project that some might equate to the Swiss watch as being uh, very detailed and very specific. And as you're adapting this to, the, to India and to your Puma area, tell us a little bit about your experience and, and how, how you think this is going to benefit India and how you think it will be accepted. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to be here today. And good evening, good evening all. So let me tell you about, am I audible? Yeah, thank you. So let me tell, uh, tell you about uh, Pune region. So Pune uh, and uh, the, this region is also called Pune metropolitan region is uh, uh, it's in Maharashtra, which is one of the third largest states of India. And Pune being a very uh, kind of important place in the history of the country, uh, Pune was seat of uh, most powerful Maratha empire in 15th to 16th century, extending its power till Afghanistan. It was also very active socially and uh, in other terms also during the freedom struggle of India. Pune is also a seat of uh, education centers. Various universities are present here, and we also are called Oxford of the East. So PMR, which is Pune Metropolitan Region, is around uh, 7,000 square kilometer, and uh, having population of around 7 million. So this is the region where uh, basically we are now trying to address climate change and uh, carbon. This is the concept of, uh, I mean, implementing carbon neutral cities. Uh, Pune being the educational center, it is also uh, is a, a, a powerful economic driver because of the presence of automobile industry, pharma. Uh, we have IT, a uh, lot of IT industries working here. We are well connected with entire India, with airports, with port, with highways. And because of that, uh, and its proximity to Mumbai, this is the most uh, uh, robust uh, 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 growing region in, in the entire entire country. So if you look at the latest growth uh, figures, uh, our uh, the PMR region with which are the uh, uh, villages or the um, uh, towns which are close to Pune Municipal Corporation are growing at the rate of 93%. But overall growth rate is around 20%. So rapid development is an is is uh, is what is we are we are witnessing at the at the same time we are we are concerned about our natural assets our our environmental issues because that is definitely putting pressure on us so balancing these two having a sustainable growth 
uh, balancing uh, development as well as our natural assets, our environment, looking at the climate issues. So these are real challenges and we are, uh, that is where actually we are now looking uh, forward to and we are basically looking at uh, 2000 watt smart city concept as uh, addressing these issues. Yeah. What would your advice be to other leaders from other developing countries that might be considering this? So I think we are in a very uh, unique situation here where, uh, uh, and I think most of the developing countries also face this situation, the regions also face this situation where the aspirations of people, the population is growing. And then we need to address those aspiration in terms of economic growth, in terms of connectivity, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of other economical activities. But at the same time, it is putting huge uh, strain on your national assets, your environment. And that, the, uh, uh, you know, having that, striking that balance is a real challenge. And I think all of you must be facing these challenges to various parts of the world. Uh, what we are talking here is we have witnessed degradation of forest. We have witnessed encroachment, excessive pressure on agriculture land, uh, very uh, un, uh, kind of uh, uh, development, very unorganized development, putting a lot of pressure on civic amenities, putting a lot of pressure on other uh, social as well as in other infrastructure. Uh, so, so what we are trying to do is we have prepared a development plan for our region, and it's a it's we call it a development plan, and the it is basically based on a sound concept of sustainable growth. So, and where we are basically talking about how we can adopt SDGs in terms of protecting our environment, uh, in terms of protect having. Uh, a growth model, which is which actually promotes development, but at the same time, you know, is equally concerned and sensitive about environmental issues. So what we are trying to do is we we have uh, come up with this development plan for next twenty years for this entire region of seven thousand square kilometer, where we are talking about uh, townships which are theme based. For example, we have we have divided the entire region in various uh, uh, urban centers where we are now promoting theme-based townships. A township, and for each region, we have given a theme, like maybe uh, industrial, uh, could be logistic, could be IT and ITS, could be agri, agri, agri development, biotechnology. And so we are develop, trying to develop township, theme-based townships, which are self-sustainable. And which are in in line with uh, you know uh, two thousand watt concept of work life uh, work and live hubs. We are trying to okay. talk about work to walk to work Thank kind you. of work. yeah. Thank you very much. I want to give the people in the audience here. We have a full boardroom um, that is here to listen to. But um, we, I'm sure that there are some questions that uh, people might have, and we'd like to have a couple minutes for questions before we move on to our next group. So. Yes, Mike, uh, Mr. Commissioner, my question to you is, uh, can you probably there? My, my, to Mr. Commissioner, my question to you is, um, you mentioned India has a very strong IT sector. What I read in both international newspapers and online Indian newspapers, that the challenges of climate change are extrapolated uh, due to the huge water consumption needed for the IT industry. Coca-Cola had to shut down production for months so the residents would actually have water. Um, and the uh, government actually had to commission trains with 250,000 liters of water per day to just make sure that the residents in Delhi, et cetera, had enough water. How do you see a changing mobility mix influencing this? Because if we replace all fossil fuel cars with electric cars, we just replace one problem with the other and for example i'm from a country where biking is very popular and made cool and uh, the for example the train station has a fifteen thousand uh capacity bike storage how do we make that cool in india um and how do you see for example the economic opportunities for your country in that aspect oh and my name is thomas by the way hi thomas uh see uh Need if need is actually mother of all inventions. That, that we believe in that. Uh, we we understand the, the the scarcity of water. We understand and we are facing 
problem because of climate change and global warming. So people are more and more, you know, aware and they are becoming more and more sensitive towards all these issues. For example, let me tell you, Pune, my region is one of the most, uh, one of the first regions where many people are now uh, basically buying uh, electric cars or electric, uh, you know, scooters. So, so the change is coming from them because they, they have realized that this is going to happen. We are looking at new technologies. We are looking, looking at uh, water recycling. So we, we, so whatever technologies are available in terms of energy saving, energy consumption, you avoiding uh, fuel, uh, fossil fuels, and because of the scale and the scope of the whole thing, I think we definitely have an advantage. Uh, the policies for government of India, the policies of my state are really uh, uh, environment friendly. We are promoting a lot of green in initiatives in terms of may, uh, achieving our. Uh, um, uh, commitment which are, which are made by our Honorable Prime Minister. My state has an uh, initiative called Race to Zero and we, we are trying to basically achieve it through various interventions, policy interventions, uh, you're changing people's attitude, changing people's response to the whole thing. And I think collectively we will be able to definitely, uh, definitely address the issues. And I, I take this opportunity, basically we need, I mean, whatever you say, say whatever is said and done, you need huge capital. You need a lot of support in terms of technology, in terms of expertise, in terms of experience, and that is where I'm looking uh, looking at at you and uh, for, for for that matter at this forum. So we need uh, uh, interventions from your end, and you are always welcome to invest in. Okay, so I'm I'm, yeah. I'm very sorry. We're on a very tight time schedule, and Understand. we have to give three organizations time. But um, I I can um, uh, give Thomas a contact information to get back with uh, your people and uh, see what if you can have a more complete conversation between the two of you. Thank you so much Thank to you. Uh, both Duhas and uh, Anna for uh, being with us this morning. And uh, it, I, don't, I understand uh, you may have a, another uh, meeting later. So, so please, whenever you need to go, go. If I May, I would like to introduce um, Peter Graham. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Peter, uh, Peter is the CEO and Executive Director of Global Buildings and Performance Network. So Peter, take it away. It's your 15, 20 minutes. Thank you. Well, thanks, Elizabeth. And hi, everybody in Glasgow and around the world and to our um, network of experts in in 22 countries and all our collaborators in India and Indonesia as well. I'm here representing a collaboration uh, between uh, the Global ABC, GBPN and the Program for Energy Efficiency in Buildings or PEEB. Um, and we're going to talk just to quickly about um, how we can incorporate building sector actions into NDCs. Um, I have some slides, Elizabeth, uh, just, to, just a short deck. Um, can I use my screen? Slides, Peter. Slides, please. Yep. Okay. I'll just I'll put on put them on my screen. Make it easy. Okay. I hope you can see those. So. Yes, yes we can. Yep. Can great. Okay. So, um, the Global ABC's status report this year has really set a big challenge for us to keep um, global warming at around 1.5 degrees. We have to actually halve building sector greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, and that's in just eight years' time. And it is possible to be able to do that with current policy know-how and finance knowledge, but what we require is a strategy, and including ambitious building sector actions in nationally determined contributions is really a powerful way to achieve and we hope exceed climate commitments while simultaneously stimulating economic development. Um, the status report shows that in 2020, 136 countries had included building sector actions in their NDCs, but there's still significant ambition gaps. And so we need to do more to support countries to develop building sector actions, which are really transform transformative and also importantly, fundable. So this is really where the NDC guide uh, came in. And 
when um, we developed the guide, we also realised that we needed to support countries who are using the guide to, with practical advice, tools and experience. So first is the guide. The guide was written by GBPN for the Global ABC and it provides a three-stage uh, approach to incorporating buildings actions in NDCs. The first is the mapping stage. And the mapping stage is about determining the status of a market in terms of building stock, energy demand, associated emissions, stakeholder mapping and capability assessment. And it generates the data for the next stage, which is the prioritization stage, which engages stakeholders in a process of determining which actions provide the best impact and contribution to achieving climate commitments and of course other public policy goals. The implementation and monitoring comes next. We plan that to uh, with stakeholders to ensure that there's buy-in from the agencies and industry sectors that are actually going to be doing the, the transformative work and trying to step our way towards the zero emissions targets. So this guide's been um, incorporated into actions uh, of developing building sector NDCs in Vietnam and Cambodia, and we'll hear from um, Vietnam in a, in a minute. But in order to really make the, the application of this guide practical, uh, Global ABC, PEEB and GBPN have, have been developing this toolkit. Uh, and uh, our colleague Andreas Gruner is on, on the call too and acknowledging his um, agency in developing this framework. And what we're doing is filling in uh, the kind of tools, practical advice, and uh, sharing examples with um, of the countries that have gone ahead to develop building sector actions in their NDCs with those countries that are aspiring to do so. So this is um, a practical toolkit. We call it a living toolkit because there are so many new, new tools coming, coming on and new methodologies being developed by countries that are starting to develop fundable and uh, transformative building sector actions for their NDC. So you can see here the scope of support that the toolkit's providing, uh, everything from the kind of tools that are required to develop a baseline assessment of emissions from a building sector, uh, from a building stock uh, through to uh, methodologies for establishing MRV um, baselines, financial incentives and non-monetary incentives, policy best practices, uh, evidence bases, as well as examples from countries that have gone ahead to develop the building sector actions themselves. So it doesn't matter where your country's at, uh, or indeed whether, or whether you might be a, a non-state actor as well with building sector commitments in mind, uh, you can use these tools and the guide so if you want more information, it, you can actually go to the Global ABC website and uh, click on the link here and you'll see a button that says collaborative platform. You go there and you'll find the NDC toolkit. There's opportunities to be able to contribute to the toolkit if you do have um, uh, case studies, best practices, um, uh, knowledge to share, experiences to share, uh, et cetera. You can also interact with that collaborative platform. So that is, um, that is the NDC guide and the NDC toolkit, but it's really hard to understand what it is uh, in, uh, until you see some examples of how uh, these kinds of uh, methodologies are used in practice. And so for that, I think I'll, I'll hand back to you, Elizabeth, as the chair, but then on to our colleague, um, Toa from Vietnam, to talk about the NDC roadmap that's been developed there. Thanks, Elizabeth. Okay, thank you. Kim, welcome to the stage. We're happy to have you with us this morning. And please share with us a little bit about how you have implemented this program in India. I'm sorry, and in Vietnam, sorry. Yeah, uh, hi. Thank you very much for providing us with an opportunity to share our experience from Vietnam with you. Um, as Peter mentioned, we make use of the, all of the <clears throat> tools so that we try to incorporate building and construction sector into the NDC of the whole economy from Vietnam. NDC is built up 
um, by the Ministry of Natural Resource and Environment with the methodology to cover the entire economy, but then with the in collaboration with the Global Alliance for Building and Construction, we received the um, format and methodology for build up the NDC building roadmap uh, with a sectoral approach that try to identify all of the opportunity that we can try to reduce the GHG uh, emission from the construction and building sector. So that work is with the own of the uh, two kids from that uh, Peter just mentioned, low, uh, uh, following the analysis, country analysis, and then um, uh, formulation of the NDC building roadmap and try to get all of those uh, documents and then the tool used by the Ministry of Construction so that we have the first draft and the final draft for the Vietnam uh, NDC building roadmap hand over to one of the people uh, working in that uh, field of work in the Ministry of Construction. So <clears throat> the work is, is contributed to the, as an input for the country to uh, build up so far the uh, national climate change response uh, action plan. And um, that work following <clears throat> the effort from uh, Global ABC, try to make the methodology available for global level and then go down to regional level. And now sub-regional of ASEAN, the 10 country of network also to build up the NDC building roadmap. And um, we hear from that that uh, at the country level, we have Vietnam, Cambodia, and Indonesia. So that um, that only by some way, um, the topic is reaching out to our um, higher level of uh, the country leadership. And then you hear um, a few days ago, the our prime minister already um, make a good um, let's say commitment that Vietnam wanted to, to reach the net zero uh, emission by 2050. That is a very encouragement, to all of us who work, the one who working in different sector, especially in building sector, so that we can see the vision clearly that, okay, we have to work hard to, to get all effort done so that we can uh, reaching <clears throat> the uh, the net zero by uh, 2050, especially in the building sector where we see technically um, a lot of opportunity. And then we have to work on more on the financially instrument or mechanism. So make all of the efforts uh, in research and in uh, uh, planning and in uh, policy making can be supported by the good financial um, facility. So the, such as uh, the green uh, bond or green financing. Thank you very much, Kim. That's very heartening. Peter, um, we're going to open it up to questions here from the boardroom. And who has anything they would like to address? Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Blondel Seleno. I'm coming from Cameroon in Central Africa. Um, there is not a lot of thing that I would like to add uh, on what is happening now, just to say that uh, uh, we are really uh, interested about all the technologies and all the projects that uh, can be made uh, in the issue to, to, to provide us a good resilience, for example, in Cameroon. We, we actually facing a lot of problem on access to energy, access to water. After, uh, there is not um, a sustainable transport, um, a sustainable transport policy which is really developed. I think that is the place where we can do a lot of things. If you're talking about Cameroon, you can also talking about Ivory Coast. You can also talking about the uh, uh, Central African Republic or Chad. There's a lot of place in Africa where we can. Uh, develop a new uh, cities, a new vision. So, because we do not actually, we do not have uh, what I can say cities. According to this small village for us. So, 
um, we we are really interested to see how together we can work into to address this kind of issue. I would like to also mention that uh, the issue of waste is a, uh, a, an issue that we should address to have a resilient city. And uh, we are really interested and we would like to see how together we can do that and how it can happening. So if there is some of you who have an idea on how we can put in place a, a strategy, because we know that the all strategy is starting at the level of um, um, the, all that, uh, at the level of strategy, so at the level of policy. Uh, at this level, also we need to have a lot of uh, thing to do. Peter or Kim, do you have a comment to share from that? Kim. Yes, I think that now uh, from Vietnam we have the central government, but we also have the municipality government. And then if we talk about the resilience in the city, that the sustainable energy development strategy needs to be addressed first. In our understanding here in Vietnam, that energy balance you by the city and then the security for energy first. And then after that, we can talk about energy saving or energy efficiency so that we can, in, we can uh, pave a way for reducing emission from energy, because we know that the emission from uh, related to energy take a big part of the emission. Uh, doesn't matter if it, it happened in, in, it consumed in the transport station sector or construction or, or all of the high intensive energy sector. So when we can manage the energy balance for the urban area development, then we can manage the emission. So it can come to the different sector and um, that is the way we see it, try to manage uh, first in the transport sector, yeah, with vehicle and other things, and then go down to the construction sector, industry and agriculture within the territory of that urban area that we are addressing. I, I, I don't know whether it can, can suggest something for Cameroon, but that is the way we do here in Vietnam. If I might add too, just on the point of strategy, uh, one of the things that, that we have found uh, really important in developing strategies for um, sector trans transitions, like building sector transitions, is really building local coalitions and building uh, stakeholder groups that can help to uh, inform government policy, but also uh, develop the, the real buy-in that's going to enable a strategy to be implemented. And, and I think that's very important because uh, it also helps to establish the kind of um, ambitious but achievable near-term targets that are necessary to really keep, keep that transformation motivating. And I think with the, the experience with uh, just, I was looking at the Vietnam process and also a process from Cambodia recently uh, developing, from developing the NDC um, actions for, for, for the building sector. Um, and it's, it's really a, uh, important to be able to have a broad, as, as Kim was saying, sort of a holistic starting point where you can see how uh, the urban, urban policy is, in, is integrated with the building sector policy and the transport policy. But I think, you know, it's, it's certainly important to establish policies, but it's also really important to establish commitments to targets, measurable uh, achievable and ambitious targets. And we talk a lot about 2050, but don't forget about 2030. We, we need to be able to, to set some very practical and achievable milestones towards that zero emissions goal. And I think that's what the, the, this process of developing roadmaps and, um, and even the bottom-up strategies that GBPN's involved with do. It, it gets the coalition behind a target and then starts to develop integrated uh, strategy to achieve it. Thank you both very much. We've got time for maybe one more question. To the representative of Cameroon, I was very glad that before the conference started, a lot of world-class athletes from all over the world spoke out about need to tackle climate change. I'm a former race rower. I cycle on my race bike. I've been a coach of the Ugandan rowing team. I think sports and the, the I would say the passion that combines all of us can be a, a good way to win people over. Uh, for example, 
in the Netherlands, cycling is very common, but you need to make it sexy. Like, and you've got some of the world class football players, runners, potential Tour de France wins in cycling. I really am hoping for MTN Quebec to do well in the next Tour de France and Vuelta. So I would invite, advise you to invite your local heroes to participate in this, making it cool, making it sexy. That if you are 12 or 18 year old, or if you're a minister, that you want to be on that bike, on that electric car, on that bus um, to an event, and uh, that be yeah, able we'll cover that easy. And I think the societal change to help bring about the 2030 targets Peter rightfully talks about is making it much sexier for people to get involved and also local and uh, accessible something they can participate in apart from the wide policy things we need to do. Thank you. It's good that people can be helping uh, within the boardroom as well. Peter and Kim, thank you very much. Um, we're going to, yeah, we appreciate you being with us. And uh, Andrea, you're, you've been waiting patiently and <laughs> listening, hopefully uh, being excited about what you're hearing. And some of you may have heard the announcement on the loudspeaker. We're being constantly reminded here at the COP about the importance of wearing masks. And believe it or not, but one of our members of, of our pavilion actually was diagnosed Saturday morning and is in quarantine. So it is serious. And I'm, we're sorry to interrupt your conversations with the background noise, but that's a, that constant reminder. So Andre, you have the last Thank 20 you. minutes of the program and yes. take it away. Thank you. Well, Thank you. I'm going to show, to show my, my screen. OK. So maybe. I have a presentation a little bit more, more technical. I'm, I'm <clears throat> representing uh, an, an international uh, organization uh, called uh, ISB that stands for International Initiative for Sustainable Environment. Um, ISB has a main goal that is to um, promote the adoption of assessment systems uh, by public authorities to improve their uh, capacity to, to act, uh, the capacity to deploy effective policies and action, action plans. And, and we have uh, developed uh, an innovative set of assessment tools that is devoted to measure the resilience and adaptation of the built environment to climate change. This because if we have the overall objective to improve the adaptation of the built environment, we need to understand what are the best strategies, what are the most effective actions. So if you can't measure what you want to improve, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to deploy effective actions. So it's necessary to have tools for measuring the risk of climate change at the different spatial scales. So specific assessment tools, specific indicators. You know that there are many existing sustainability assessment tools already available at transnational or a national level, but those tools have not been conceived for measuring the risk <laughs> due to the climate change. So we have developed this set of new tools uh, called resilient built environment tools so that are useful for measuring exactly uh, the risk and the adaptation of buildings, small urban areas, settlement and, and territories. And the tools are based on the risk assessment approach uh, of the IPCC. Uh, so where the risk is uh, related to the hazard, uh, vulnerability and, and exposure. So what, what we did basically is, has been to mainstream the risk assessment uh, in the sustainability assessment uh, methodology. And, and we used uh, a specific methodology that is transnational and open source that is called uh, uh, sustainable environment method. So basically we have created a new generation of assessment tools creating a sort of hybrid. So in, in mainstreaming the risk assessment in the sustainability assessment tools. Uh, this transnational methodology, the SBE methodology, has been developed through a cooperation uh, process starting in the late uh, 90s, participated by 25 uh, countries. And uh, the, this method is based on a, a basic assumption. It's not possible to share 
transnationally one unique uh, common assessment system because each region has different uh, conditions, uh, different priorities. Uh, so it is necessary to use uh, for assessment local tools. But in the same time, we have to, to uh, uh, measure how much we are progressing toward the common, the common goals. So uh, the, the, the way to, uh, to, find, uh, to find this uh, uh, local global approach has been to uh, define the principle of the generic frameworks. So basically, uh, it's possible to define transnationally common measuring system, common assessment systems, but the you need to contextualize to be used in your local context. So from a common source, it's possible to generate local harmonized assessment systems. Uh, over time, uh, several generic frameworks of this kind have been developed, starting from maybe the most famous is the Sustainable Building Tool or SB Tool, then others have been generated at the neighborhood or territorial scale. Now this principle has been applied to generate this new family of generic frameworks, the RB tools, that is possible to use to create a contextualized assessment system for the adaptation of the built environment for any region, any country in, uh, in the world. Um, the possibility, this, these tools have been developed through uh, a series of uh, European projects in the field of Interreg. Interreg is the uh, regional cooperation, uh, territorial cooperation in Europe. There are different programs in different areas, Alpine space, Mediterranean, uh, Alcotra, French, Italian. So through this series of projects, we have been able to define this, the new set of tools. And we have collaborated with dozens of organizations uh, in, in Europe, both public authorities and scientific organizations. It's very important to keep the collaboration with the public authorities, so the end users of the systems, it will use this, the, the rating tool, the assessment tools to uh, support the decision-making processes. So how, how it, that has been possible to mainstream the risk assessment in sustainability assessment tools? But we use the impact chains. The impact chains are well described in the vulnerability source book published by GIZ. Uh, an impact chain is a, a framework, a logical framework that connect a risk to an hazard and impact and to the vulnerability. So we have adapted the sustainability tool uh, framework to the risk uh, assessment based on the impact chain. And we have identified uh, reference climatic hazards and reference risk groups, people, property, infrastructures, et cetera. We have created the metrics uh, with the risk groups uh, and the hazards and crossing risk groups and hazards in a specific, specific special scale, for instance, building scale, you can easily identify what is the potential risk. For instance, uh, if you have a heat wave, so this is the hazard, uh, the, who, exp who is exposed are the inhabitants, the occupants of the building, and the risk, of course, is for the inhabitants' health and comfort. So using the impact chain uh, that connects the hazard with the risk group, it's possible to identify what are the vulnerability aspects in this case of a building. It is possible to do the same for the neighborhood or for, for a settlement or for a territory. The vulnerability aspects are the assessment criteria. So what has to be assessed to verify the level of datation of the level of resilience of the building. And uh, each criterion is connected to an indicator that represents the sensitivity and to uh, a value of the indicator that represents the level of adaptation. Uh, so we have created the set of tool with the seven uh, hazards and the six risk, uh, risk groups. And each uh, uh, risk groups contains, its category of criteria, contains the specific, specific vulnerability aspects that we can assess. Um, the different tools contains a different number of uh, criteria and indicators uh, that have been uh, the, in, um, defined through the um, impact chains. There are around 50 criteria in the building tool uh, and around 150 in the neighborhood scale tool, uh, about 150 also in the uh, settlement tool and more than 200 in the territorial uh, scale. Um, the system uh, is a scoring system. So all the values of the indicators can be transformed in score, in scores, and the scores represents the level of the adaptation and resilience of a building, neighborhood, settlement, or territory. Higher the number, more adapt is the, is the, uh, the building, for instance. 
And it's also possible to aggregate the value of the distance criteria through the weight sums. And the weight of the criteria depends on the local context, it depends on the, uh, on the uh, importance of the different climatic hazards and on the, on the importance of how many elements are exposed. And it's also possible to carry out the, the assessments of uh, uh, the adaptation resilience, uh, also taking account the future climatic conditions so that you can predict what will be the level of adaptation of a neighbor or a settlement, depending on the different RCP uh, scenarios. At the end of the assessment, you get uh, a scoreboard. In this scoreboard, you can have it for a building, a neighbor, the settlement, a territory. You get scores. The scores represent how much uh, what is, has been assessed is adapted to the seven uh, climatic hazards. You can also visualize scores at level of categories, so of risk groups. So you can see uh, how has been managed the risk for the different risk groups. And also you can see the scores at a single uh, criterion level. So you can visualize how much is adapted the building network, et cetera, to the specific vulnerability uh, experts. We have developed an online uh, platform that is accessible, is open source. Uh, any, any authority can access it. And it's possible here to create your local assessment tool. It's possible to use the platform to carry out the assessments. There is also a GIS module where you can upload information and you can calculate the, the resilience of, of, of a, terri a territorial or urban uh, scale. We have also developed an, a, a, a second function, a second online tool uh, that is the, called Felicity, where you can easily create a, a 3D model of any urban uh, area in the world. Uh, you can carry out uh, simulations concerning the CO2 emissions and the primary energy consumptions of, of buildings. Uh, and you can uh, use this information that is not always easy to get at territorial urban scale. You can use this information uh, for, carry out, uh, for carrying out the, the resilience assessment. So this is to, uh, to tell that assessment systems are very useful to provide information to take the right decisions. If you don't have information, decision making could be quite weak. You need uh, to have uh, assessment systems to carry out the diagnosis of uh, the actual situation, to select the best scenarios, to monitor the implementation of scenarios. And this kind of tools uh, would like to provide a contribution to establish a sort of common language in measuring this kind of uh, 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 issues. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andreas. And do you, is Teresa coming? Teresa is not present in person, but uh, uh, she sent me a video that I can uh, share uh, share with you if we have time. It's a seven minute video. Yes, we have time. Okay. So just give me <laughs> the opportunity to, to start it. So any of you be thinking about questions you might have? It looks Hello. like you have some interest. Today we're going in... to talk about how the world wants to work and what needs to change. Okay. Imagine that you are above the earth looking down. What do you see? You see dark ribbons across the land. These lines mark underground waterways and riparian systems. Forests will thrive above and around them. This is where nature wants to create its wilderness corridors. Nature lives in ribbons, rivers, coastlines, mountain ranges, and forest corridors. She does not form grids. Look at the earth again. We have paved one kilometer of road for every square kilometer of habitable land around the world. Most of these roads form grids. The center of every grid block, the hole in the donut, is an island. Science writer David Quammen said, islands are where species go to die. Because our road base is deep, dense, and compacted gravel, the roots and the fungi that allow trees to communicate through the soils cannot pass under our roads. Trees trapped in these islands will weaken and die over time. Our grid pattern destroys eco-corridors and the wildlands and the wildlife they support. As we work and shop from home and we begin to share cars, we will need our roads less. It will eventually be easier for us to abandon the paved grid and to align the roads we do need 
with nature's eco corridors. So where are all these roads going? Look again, this time toward the coastline. See the big cities there? By 2050, 80% of us will live in coastal cities, although they are near water. <laughs> Our cities function as deserts. This is because about 70% of the unbuilt surface of every city is paved and roads and roofs do not absorb water. They encourage runoff. Whenever nature sees runoff on land, she reads that land as desert. All deserts contribute to the process of desertification, creating more deserts by disrupting the natural rain cycles. And this effect is felt 400 miles inland. The land impacted by desertification will experience drought and wildfire. It actually costs us less to work with nature and let our cities become green. Look along the coastline again, see the river mounds? These are wetlands, peat bogs, and delta. Notice that most of our cities are built here. This is because our industrial age needed river ports for the distribution of goods. Wetlands and peat bogs are carbon and pollutant scrubbers. They should never be drained or built on. If we do not build on wetlands, we do support wildlife habitat and we prevent floods. Okay, so look at that blue planet below you. From up here, it looks like we have an infinite supply of water. But that water is 97% salt, 2% ice, and only 1% fresh. That 1% includes all the aquifers, rivers, and lakes. Without fresh water, there is no life on land. So we must follow in nature's footsteps and reuse and protect fresh water locally. The oceans also produce 70% of Earth's oxygen. Oceans cannot replenish our oxygen if they are sick. We must keep our oceans clean. Take a look at the white clouds up here in the atmosphere. Water vapor, not CO2, is the most powerful greenhouse gas. The ocean atmosphere dynamic is a magical dance that controls our climate. Three of every four molecules of CO2 in the atmosphere today was put there by us. The oceans have absorbed 90% of the heat energy resulting from the greenhouse effect we have caused or that is equal to five Hiroshima bombs per second since 1990. That's the energy that the oceans have absorbed since 1990. So this is the reason our atmosphere has not heated up as much as expected, but the oceans are now reaching heat saturation. So total decarbonization of human activity must start now. Okay, so imagine that it's still daytime, but the lights are coming on as dusk approaches. Look again at the land. See the power lines strung across it. They run for miles to hydroelectric, coal-fired, or nuclear power generation plants. There is a 70% loss of power from the plant to the plug because of these line losses. These centralized power plants are an industrial age legacy. Centralized power supports industries we don't need and has a 70% inefficiency built into it. We need to do what nature does, use waste and solar energy locally. Okay, so now drop down to city level, look around in the night. The buildings are massive. You see lights everywhere, but the schools, the offices, government buildings, many other buildings, shops are empty as are one in five apartments. We are 20% overbuilt and 30% unused worldwide in Europe, North America, and China. To get there, we have removed more stuff from Earth since 1990 than in all of human history. Half of it was for construction and 75% of it is already back in landfill. You might think it's because We've got more people and population is growing so fast. Well, global population grew 12% since 2010. Construction grew 22% in the same period, almost double the rate. 
of the construction of the population growth. Nature never overbuilds and wastes resources like this. We need to follow her example and build only what we need. What are we really doing when we think we are building well? By ignoring human, social, and environmental capitals, we are not building well. We are creating a debt to the future. We need to understand how nature achieves its own resilience. Then we can direct our actions to support all life on Earth. So how do we change the world? The answer is, we don't. We need to stop trying to change the world to support our ideas. Instead, we need to change our ideas to support Earth. Thank you for listening. I am Teresa Cody, an architect from British Columbia, Canada, and the author of Rebuilding Earth, Designing Eco-Conscious Habitats for Humans. Okay, we have one minute if anybody has any questions. I would just, oh, Peter? Yep, hi, Andrea. I couldn't resist just asking about um, whether you, the, one of the users or intended user groups for your resilience risk assessment would be finance and investing. Yes, it is. It, we already had meetings with uh, in the, in the investment sectors because, uh, you know, actually the, the value also of real estate funds is, uh, also, is also linked to the sustainability and future resilience of, of, of buildings. So the, the investment side is, is very uh, somehow worried about how much the climate change can affect the value of, of the buildings. So we, we already started to discuss with some very important uh, stakeholders in this field about how to carry out a sort of a triage of their building stocks to understand the actual level of uh, adaptation resilience and also to project into future this level of adaptation to understand in 2030, 2050, what, what would be the performance of, of the buildings and the building stocks considering the possible uh, IPCC scenarios. So uh, the answer is uh, yes, it's uh, something that is, uh, will be taken more and more into consideration by the financial sector. Thank you. Kim? Kim, please. You're, you're muted. You're muted. Um, I'm very interested in your presentation, Andrea, especially in Pelly City. Yeah, in Vietnam, we know how to calculate the point shot, let's say emission from one building or from, from transportation like a line, line sort. But area sort for the whole city is something very challenging for us. So your fellow city, you mentioned more energy consumption and carbon emission for the whole city. That would be very interesting for Vietnam. I would like to learn from you more on that. Yes, thank you. And the, the reason why Felicity was uh, developed is exactly because usually at urban or territorial scale, you have problems to get reliable and credible data concerning CO2 emissions uh, and, uh, and consumption. This platform is based on the GIS data uh, and uh, you can create 3D models and in inputting our only very few data, you get very reliable information, quite useful to take uh, decisions at urban scale level about the strategies to be implemented. So I will provide you uh, after the, the session more, more information uh, no problem thank you very much <laughs> thank you very much thank you all so much for participating and especially these people in the boardroom but thank you to so many of you who are remotely listening to these experts offering advice and know that you can go to their websites and locate additional information um, they're here offering their services for you so everybody who is participating, everybody who is joining us here, thank you for being here, for listening to this story. And please, in the next three days, find at least three people to share the story with. That's how we make a difference. Thank you all for your time and your energy. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.